Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 407 for the 7th of August 2016. Richard Saunders here with you from Sydney, Australia, which is still nice and wintry. Coming up on this week's show, we're going to be chatting to an old friend of mine, an old friend of the Skeptic Zone, Dr. Paul Willis. Well known to um, listeners in Australia, Dr. Paul Willis was a former ABC science reporter, ABC TV, on their TV show Catalyst for many years. And then he went and joined the Royal Institution of Australia. And as Skeptic Zone listeners will remember, for some years we were playing a week in science from the Royal Institution of Australia. That sort of wound up. Why? Well, Paul will tell us, and he'll tell us all about the um, exciting new venture, Australia's Science Channel. Oh, yes, a portal, an internet portal devoted to science. Well, I know there are many of those, but this has got an interesting sort of twist to it. Find out more coming up at the top of the show when we chat to Dr. Paul Willis. Following that, it's a brief report about a chiropractor here in Australia who's been charged with breaching advertising requirements. And about time. And I have a funny feeling that uh, this is only the tip of the iceberg. Watch this space. I think we'll be um, reporting about this sort of thing coming up more and more. Following that, we uh, look at the checkout. The checkout, another ABC TV program, which is all about consumer affairs, which we enjoy. The recent episode, a recent episode, covered something that uh, skeptics have been talking about for many years. That is quackery in pharmacies. When you go into your pharmacy shop, You expect to buy a legitimate science-based medicine. But sadly, there are shelves full of pure quackery. The Checkout TV program looked into this. I'll run a short clip. And also, I'll be reading an open letter that the Australian Skeptics wrote uh, a few years back about ear candling. Yeah, ear candling. And sadly, you can still buy ear candles in pharmacies. Then to round off the show, we head back to Sydney, skeptics in the pub, and ask the big question, how long should you debate with a conspiracy theorist before giving up? And that question was sent to us by a listener, Tom Kelly. Thank you, Tom. And uh, he sent that in via the Skeptic Zone Facebook page. And you're welcome to go to the Skeptic Zone Facebook page. The links are at skepticzone.tv if you want to add your comments to any particular episode. And speaking of SkepticZone.tv, if you go there now, you will see a link to iHeartRadio. Yes, the Skeptic Zone is now on the iHeartRadio network, as well as iTunes and Stitcher and YouTube. Those people living in Sydney, look out on Saturday the 13th of this month, just over a week away, or just under a week away, at the Australian Museum Super Science Saturday. If you check out australianmuseum.net.au or Google Super Science Saturday, it's a great fun day full of science, and I will be performing there with Maynard. We'll be doing the Mystery Investigator Show. I think we've got a couple of shows lined up during the course of the day. So if you want to come by, bring the kids and check out the mystery investigators. We'll be bending spoons. We have a bed of nails. We'll be doing all that sort of fun thing. Water divining, explaining science. I'll certainly add a link to the show notes this week. And before we get stuck into the show, a note from our friends at the Canberra Skeptics. Uh, I think the best way to visit them would be via meetup.com. Social Skeptics Canberra is the name of the group. Anyway, on the 9th of August, coming up pretty soon actually, this is um, coming Tuesday, at 6pm at King O'Malley's Irish Pub Oh, that's a, a nice pub, I've been there many times, it's a mini sort of skeptic camp the speaker is you, if you turn up this month, it says on the meetup page, we're doing something a little different to celebrate Science Week a skeptic camp, for those who haven't attended a skeptic camp before, speakers will sign up on the night We'll be there from 5.30pm and talks will start around 6.10pm and each speaker will have 5 to 10 minutes 
on their topic. So there you are, folks, in Canberra. Check it out, and I'll add a link to the show notes. Well, that's enough for me. It's time for me to run downstairs, indulge myself a little bit, and have a few uh, squares of some nice white chocolate, an old favourite. Who remembers the Milky Bar Kid? Mm. While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Joining me now from the Royal Institution of Australia, an old friend of the Skeptic Zone, the widely travelled Dr. Paul Willis. Hello, Paul. Doesn't that sound posh, the Royal Institution of Australia? Yeah, I always thought it did, but that's what it's called, right? Yeah, well, that's exactly what it's called. In fact, I now figure that because of my position, I'm entitled to an adjunct Nobel laureate. (laughs) <laughs> my reasoning is that uh, my predecessors in this role uh, in the Royal Institution in Great Britain, uh, they've uh, most of them have been Nobel laureates. So I figure I deserve one as well. I think so. And well, let's face it, you know, just one of the low hanging fruit, one of the easy ones, you know, world peace or literature or something. <laughs> no, nothing too taxing. Look, we'll have we'll have a word we'll have a word to the committee and see what we can we can work out for you. Paul. I think you deserve I think you deserve one anyway. I, before, now, before we get too far into it, of course, uh, Skeptic Zone listeners, long-time Skeptic Zone listeners will be very familiar with the Royal Institution of Australia f- because for some years, each week, we were playing a wonderful segment produced by the Royal Institution of Australia called A Week in Science. What happened to that, Paul? Oh, look, Week in Science was a lot of fun. Uh, we had it running for three years, I think it was, and uh, you know, it went through various evolutions along the way. Um, but now we've uh, turned our attention to uh, a new kind of vodcast, uh, a new production. It's called Brouhaha, and basically they're little one-minute vodcasts which uh, uh, sum up whatever's on their mind when it comes to the science that's in the zeitgeist out there. Mm. So uh, that's one to watch out for on Australia's science channel, Br- Brouhaha. Brouhaha, that sounds pretty interesting. Now you've mentioned it, we better talk about it. And the reason, really, one of the reasons I'm chatting you, to you today is that uh, if I go to the Royal Institution of Australia's website, riaus.org.au, it says Australia's Science Channel. What's that all about? <laughs> Look, uh, Australia's Science Channel is the platform that we've uh, been developing along with Hostworks. Uh, which is uh, an online on-demand channel which can handle video, it can handle audio, it can handle written work, it can handle mixed media, you name it, it can handle it. And uh, so basically anything to do with science of suitable quality uh, we will put out to the world through Australia's Science Channel. So we not only create material ourselves to go on Australia's Science Channel, Uh, We also aggregate from universities, museums and all kinds of sources around the country. Anybody who wants to talk about science, this is a great little hub in order to be able to do that. It looks looks fascinating. And I've just noticed, of course, that uh, there's another website, another URL here, which is riaus.tv. Is that that different? That's the actual platform itself, yeah. So there's the uh, the old website, which is rios.org.au, which now is kind of a, a legacy site, and uh, that will refer you over to Australia's Science Channel, which is, you see, one of the problems that we've had with uh, the Royal Institution of Australia, or we used to call ourselves RIOS, is that it takes a while to explain exactly what it is that you do. Uh, whereas if you say Australia's Science Channel... Everybody knows instantly what it is that you do. You talk about science to the world. Uh, you talk about Australian science to the world. And so uh, that's why we've had that switch. So there's still the parent company, if you like, behind it, which is the Royal Institution of Australia. Uh, but our public platform is Australia's Science Channel. OK, and just flipping over there right now to that website, it's seems to me at first glance heavily video orientated we've got something here from the grandfather paradox but what i like about it is it gives you a sort of a big thumbnail selection of of content and uh, 
the time. So there's things that only go for a couple of minutes, things that go longer. There's things that go for nearly an hour. There's quite a selection. Yeah, look, it, it's one of the. It's rapidly building up into a, a case of you know. Uh, uh, I don't know about you, but I sit at home uh, on a night when there's nothing free to air on the telly that I want to watch. I'll sit there with SBS on demand or ABC iView and just cruise around and watch what I want when I want. Um, that's what the Australia Science Channel is there for. That's the kind of market. With, for those people who are specifically interested in science. Now, a large chunk of this uh, Australia Science Channel is given over to uh, a dedicated area we call the Ultimate Science Guide, which is all about STEM careers. Not only is it uh, tied to our print publication, the Ultimate Science Guide, which is an annual compendium of careers in science, technology, engineering and maths, but because we've got it on the Australia Science Channel... Uh, we can back it up with all kinds of interesting videos. There's over 80 videos there that are young, bright researchers in all kinds of careers uh, saying to, to the next generation, hey, six months ago I didn't know what a nanotechnologist was, but now I am one, and this is how much fun I'm having, and this is, these, these are the possible careers you can have. So by providing this smorgasbord of, of career opportunities, hopefully we can stimulate that whole STEM discussion uh, that's out there in, in the Australian zeitgeist at the moment. I think that's, that's a wonderful uh, endeavour. Uh, just again, folks, clicking through the website, I've just clicked on the video link, which takes you deeper into the site. And yes, the, the list of quick, short, interesting videos is extensive and it goes on for page after page after page. You also have a link there to podcasts and to uh, science articles, plus all sorts of other links. W what was the, the genesis of this idea? How long has this been kicking around before you finally got it going? Well, you know, when I, I've been in this job now for just over five years and it wasn't long after I got here that I said, what we need is a television channel uh, online so that uh, we can, you know, make and, 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 and bring together uh, good science videos. And, and initially there was some scepticism as to whether that was possible and we were pushing around it. We didn't want just another YouTube channel because of it, uh, another YouTube channel, uh, you can't curate the content the way that you want to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, so, you know, we were kind of in a quandary as to, oh, I've never set up a television channel before. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. And then we had the fortune to, to come across a guy called Will Berryman, um, who was also another ex-ABC Science Journal. But he got out of uh, ABC Science uh, prior to me actually getting into ABC Science. And he's gone on to quite an illustrious career in uh, digital uh, media. And now he heads up this company, Hostworks, which is all about uh, building online platforms such as uh, SBS On Demand, uh, ABC iView. iView uh, it's, they do all the back-end heavy lifting for uh, Ticker Tech and for Jetstar bookings and all sorts of really deep data management uh, tools in, uh, in the online environment. And Will took a shine to what it is that we wanted to do, and he said, hey, would you like me to build you a television channel? And I said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And so we've been working together um, ever since uh, to actually make this happen. Officially, we launched, um, the corporate launch was actually in late 2014, and uh, we've spent the last oh, 18 months or so just really building up the, the platform so that it's robust enough, it's diverse enough, it's appealing enough that now we can get out there and start doing the big audience push and say, mm. look, come and play, ladies and gentlemen. This is a resource we've built specifically for you to come and play in that science domain. Well, folks, the uh, URL is quite easy to remember, R-I-A-U-S dot TV. That's the new one. That's the one, folks, to go to. Paul, how much original content is there, or are you farming other content? Uh, well, we, we, we're sourcing content from all across the country, mm -hmm. and I would like to get more from regional areas. And this is the beauty of RIOS TV. If you've got a science story to tell, 
and you're in you know the, the token wall or or, or uh, somewhere you know way off the beaten track yeah you can actually now do it if you you can sit down and simply write a blog about what science you're up to in the outback and you can email it to us and we will shape it up into something that will go on Australian Science Channel. So this is, you know, this is for everybody to come and play in. That's that's a great offer, folks. There's the offer from Dr. Paul Willis. Now, Paul, uh, let's talk about something else for a moment here. As I mentioned at the top of the uh, the interview, the well-traveled Paul Willis, how many times now have you been to the Antarctic? Uh, look, I, I know it sounds like I'm bragging, but to be honest, I can't, <laughs> can't remember, remember if it's 10 or 11. <laughs> uh, I'm going there again next year, uh, in February next year, and uh, I, I think that's trip number 11. Wow. Um, but uh, the opportunity is there to go down into some of the most, uh, some of the richest fossil beds in the world. Uh, and to see at the Antarctic Peninsula, it's. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to going back there. By the way, uh, there are still some berths available on the boat if anyone is interested in coming along. Oh yes, <laughs> what, what, t- tell me more. Tell me more. Oh look, uh, I go down to Antarctica as the ship's paleontologist on board a ship called the Polar Pioneer, mm-hmm. which is run by a, a company called uh, Aurora Expeditions. And they are a travel company that specialises in uh, tours to remote and difficult to get at places. So they they cruise the Antarctic every uh, southern uh, summer, and uh, they cruise the Arctic in every northern summer. Wow! And uh, I go along to help interpret the geology and the paleontology uh, on some of their trips. So uh, if you are interested in joining me, uh, uh, see some amazing fossils uh, and uh, one of the experiences that should be on everyone's bucket list, and that is to drink a decent quality scotch over glacial ice. Oh, wow. Uh, If you want to come along and do that with me, uh, get in touch uh, through Aurora Expeditions and we'll see what we can do for you. Uh, I, personally, of course, I would love to. Folks, we'll put a link to that on the website. And you did a wonderful thing oh, some years back, Paul. You were on the on the ship. I don't know if it was the same one, but you did the homeopathy challenge <laughs> from oh, the that Antarctic. Was fun. That was fun because uh, not long before uh, I went off on that particular cruise, uh, I got the call. I uh, can't even remember where the call was from at the moment. But I got the call saying, uh, uh, you know, uh, that they were having this international homeopathy challenge and they got representatives from every continent except Antarctica. (laughs) And I said, I think I might be able to help you there. So I took along some homeopathic sleep preparation and uh, we're out there on the bow of the ship. And I try to overdose on this, but the ship's doctor was was a great pal. Uh, He was actually standing by with the defibrillator. Uh, just in case anything went wrong. But in the spirit of it being a homeopathic test, we didn't plug the defibrillator in so that it would work on the memory of having once started someone's heart. That's a great video. I'm glad you did that. And, folks, once again, I'll, I'll link to that video uh, in the show notes so you can view view that. What what's is, is there internet down there, Paul? Can you do things like live streaming? Uh, look, uh, live streaming uh, is probably a bit data hungry. Mm. Um, uh, we now can handle emails, right. but not very many, mm. and uh, and no attachments, uh, and and so sending images in and out is uh, is a bit of a no no at the moment. They are, of course, looking at how they can upgrade that, but yeah. as you can imagine, the only way they can do it at the moment is via satellites yes. and. Uh, that's uh, that's expensive stuff. It is, but I guess bit by bit, that would be exciting one day to have uh, Paul Willis down there and we could join you virtually oh. as you walk along finding fossils of plesiosaurs or whatever. Most <laughs> definitely. Uh, th- uh, th- that would be my first uh, list on the priorities there, mate, would be a, a live interview with you from <laughs> Antarctica. Are you up for that when, when the technology catches up to us? I- I'm up for that and I'm up for going there as well. Have you, uh, w- during your expeditions down there and looking for fossils and whatnot, have you made uh, short videos? Yourself? Uh, look, I, I made a couple of stories for Catalyst uh, right. over the years. Right, uh, right. 
And uh, like uh, uh, some of them, I was able to take a producer with me, and so there were two of us uh, actually doing it. But the last couple of stories I filed from Antarctica, uh, I, I did the whole thing myself. Right. Um, so you know, uh, uh, that's quite a challenge, uh, particularly in the Antarctic, to be able to film something that, as you're actually trying to <laughs> present it in front of the camera and what have you. Um, and this time down in uh, Antarctica, I will be doing some filming for Australia Science Channel. Excellent. Uh, I've got a couple of stories in mind that uh, would sit very well on uh, on Australia Science Channel, and so I'll be whipping out the camera and getting back in the harness and uh, and trying to earn my crust in front of the lens again. That sounds good to me, Paul. Just 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 to remind you, you know that I do um, uh, video and film production and editing. <clears throat> really? Do you? Just Honest, to, just yeah. to mention it, you know, just just in you, case. What, you want, um, in case in case you want to come along in the hand luggage. <laughs> Now, that thought hadn't occurred to me, Paul. It really hadn't. Folks, once again, the website is riaus.tv. Please check it out, Australians and people all around the world, especially if you're in Australia, of course. And if you have a science project, if you're involved in science, if you're in the regional areas especially, maybe this channel can be something that uh, can really help you out. Well, Paul, what a delight to catch up with you once again. I'm very... Yeah, um, good to hear your voice too, thank too you. Uh, Richard. Uh, it, it, it's one of the, the the downsides of being half a continent away. So I don't get to see you as much as I used to. It, well, I mean, we do we do get together very occasionally. We have a lot of fun. and But I know that you're really enjoying living in that beautiful city of Adelaide. Well, some people have it tough, Paul Willis, but I'm glad you don't. Anyway, for now, <laughs> Dr. Paul Willis, thank you very much. Always a pleasure, Richard. Mr. Katz, origami jewellery, pendants, earrings and cufflinks. All handmade by yours truly, Richard Saunders, and featuring many popular designs like Origami Pegasus the Flying Pig. You can find the store at facebook.com slash Mr. Cat's Origami, or by following the link at skepticzone.tv. On the website of Australian Skeptics, australianskeptics.com.au, published on the 2nd of August, written by Tim Mendham. Chiropractor charged with false advertising. The Australian Healthcare Practitioner Regulatory Agency, AHPRA, has charged a New South Wales chiropractor with breaching advertising requirements, alleging his website advertised chiropractic services in a way that was likely to be false, misleading, or deceptive. This follows the Chiropractic Board of Australia's action against Victorian chiropractor Ian Rossborough, who was banned from treating children under two years old. But in this case, the chiropractor is unnamed and the charge is not listed. In a statement, AHPRA says that, quote, the charges were laid last week. As this matter is now before the courts, we are unable to comment further on this particular case, end quote. This is in contrast to the Rossborough case in which the chiropractor was named even when he was the subject of an investigation, let alone when any findings were made against him. AHPRA CEO Martin Fletcher said the agency took its role of promoting the public, quote, very seriously, end quote. Quote, anyone advertising a regulated health service, regardless of whether they are registered health practitioners or not, must meet the requirements of the law. Patients and consumers have a right not to be misled by unclear or deceptive advertising, end quote. As an aside, oh boy, this guy should visit the MindBody wallet one day. Good grief. <clears throat> we read on. CBA chair Dr. Wayne Minter said it is important that patients are well informed and understand the treatments recommended by their chiropractor as with treatments from all regulated health professionals. Quote, Chiropractors must practice in an evidence-based way, and their advertising must not make false or misleading claims about treatments. As a patient, you have the right to understand the potential risks or benefits about a treatment for your individual circumstances. If you're not sure, 
get a second opinion, end quote. And that comes to us from Australian Skeptics at skeptics.com.au. Edinburgh, the home of the Scottish Enlightenment. The city that produced such sceptical luminaries as David Hume, James Hutton, Peter Higgs and Mary Somerville. Edinburgh, the Athens of the North, which for 300 years has been at the forefront of science, medicine and the arts. Edinburgh, home to insanely successful tourist ghost tours and haunted pubs. In August, the city hosts the world's biggest arts festival, where the population seems to double and the streets are awash with wannabe comedians all vying for our attention. Who in their right mind would, in the middle of all this, try and organise 23 different, three sceptical events across 23 consecutive nights? Edinburgh Skeptics, that's who. From Saturday the 6th to Sunday the 26th of August, we'll be putting on different free talk every single night. We're in the Banshee Labyrinth on Nidri Street at 7.50. If you're coming up to the city in August, please check out our website, edinburghskeptics.co.uk, for the full lineup, and please come along and say hi. Edinburgh Skeptics, undiluted brilliance. In a recent episode of ABC Television's The Checkout, which is a consumer affairs information show, they really, shall we say, ripped into pharmacies here in Australia who carry all sorts of nonsense, like homeopathy. Now, shortly I'll play a short clip from this story from the checkout, but I'll also include the, uh, the in the show notes the link to the website of the checkout, or if you just Google the checkout, ABC TV, you'll find that website. And I'm pleased to say that they put up a lot of their content on YouTube, which you can see around the world, and I'll certainly link to the video in question as well. But it reminded me of a letter that I helped uh, write with the Australian Skeptics ooh, way back in 2011, I think it was, which was an open letter to the pharmacists of Australia concerning the sale and promotion of ear candles. Now, some years ago, I read this uh, this open letter out on the Skeptic Zone, but I think it's time I think it's time I read it out again. An open letter to the pharmacists of Australia. Australians trust pharmacies and chemist shops. As pharmacists, you play an important role in the health care of the Australian public by functioning as a conduit between doctors and prescription of pharmacy drugs. You also have a respected role as a first resource for medical advice for many people in our community. We are all familiar with the slogan, Ask Your Pharmacist. When we ask our pharmacist, what kind of answers do we want? Not quack products like ear candles that do nothing except pose a hazard. We now ask our Australian pharmacists, what standards do you set for yourselves? You sell a growing number of products which there is little or no scientific evidence of efficacy. Calling them, quote, alternative, end quote, does not make them work. Examples include homeopathic preparations, magnetic pain relief devices, detox programs, dodgy weight loss products, and ear candles. Such products commonly appear in the natural medicine section of pharmacies, but are sometimes displayed alongside real medicines whose benefits are scientifically proven. Ear candles are of particular concern. There are reports of serious injuries from them, including temporary hearing loss, Burns, ear canals blocked by dripping wax, punctured eardrums. Health Canada has banned them in Canada. Even the first professor of alternative and complementary medicine at Exeter University, Edson Ernst, called for them to be banned. Despite this, many Australian pharmacies are selling them. What next? Will you start selling cigarettes like supermarkets, who you do not want to be allowed to sell pharmaceuticals because they do not have qualified staff? What standards do you set for yourself and your staff? We see a growing trend for so-called, quote, practitioners, end quote, with little or no scientific training being brought in as, quote, consultants, end quote, including iridologists, homeopaths, and naturopaths. 
iridology is a discredited way of diagnosing the dysfunction of internal organs via the markings on the iris. There is no evidence that it works, but some pharmacies promote the fact that their customers can get, quote, readings, end quote, in their stores. Your customers rely on you and anyone in a professional capacity within your store to provide sound medical advice and products. We fear that in some cases, what they are receiving amounts to little more than magical sugar pills and spurious health advice. Pharmacies need to make a profit, but that should not be done through quack products and bad advice. To regain the status, a pharmacy should have a place to get sound advice and effective medicine supported by scientific and clinical evidence, we implore our pharmacists to stick to worthy products sold by knowledgeable staff. And that was an open letter produced by the Australian Skeptics way back in 2011. And just as an aside, I happened to be in a pharmacist only a couple of days ago to get some some medication, and there on the shelf were ear candles. So they are still being sold. And that's why pharmacies only stock products with proven clinical outcomes, like Brower's homeopathic snorries. Hang on, haven't we already done a story on homeopathy being bullshit? Uh, no, I don't think we did. Ah, good. As I was saying, a genuine, effective medicine like hey, this... Hey, stop there! No, the, the reason we didn't do one is because homeopathy is so transparently bogus and debunked that we didn't think there was any point explaining that to people. OK, well, a genuine medicine like this, liquid chlorophyll extract, which... No, 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 no. Look, I'll just come down there. OK, if you're looking for treatment supported by current and accepted evidence, you can forget about chlorophyll. We've done that. You can forget these weight loss vitamins. You can forget superfoods. You can forget targeted painkillers. And you can forget this cough syrup. The point is, pharmacies have shelves full of complementary medicines, and for the vast majority of them, evidence of their effectiveness is very slim indeed. Ah, but is it slim because of this coconut and lemon detox? We've done detoxes too. So even though you have to go to a pharmacist for access to medicines that are proven to be effective... That doesn't mean that everything you get from a pharmacist is going to be effective. Big chains have increased competition, and because Australian law forbids the direct marketing of prescription medicines... Which is good. Pharmacies end up pushing complementary medicines that much harder. Try Healthy Care Original Lung Detox from Chemist Warehouse. To the point that some even have in-store naturopaths. Which is bad. That's just a hippie. Actually, naturopaths can look just like any other pharmacy worker. (laughs) Sorry. Can I go back to the office now? Sure. Hats off to the checkout television program here in Australia, reminding us that these things are still being sold in pharmacies across the country. Would you like a coffee? Yeah, thanks. What are you working on? I'm trying to come up with a new promo to play on the Skeptic Zone. Who's it for? Uh, the Good Thinking Society in the UK. You know, Michael Marshall, Simon Singh, Laura Thomas and that crowd. Oh, yeah, I know them. Oh. They've been doing some great work investigating veterinary homeopathy. <laughs> veterinary homeopathy? What, you sugar pills for cows? I know, right? And also they're looking at some of the dodgy medical advice given by UK chiropractors. Really? Okay, look, I'll mention all that in the promo. Now, their website is goodthinkingsociety.org. And And Hmm? they've recently been reporting on the resurgence of faith healer Peter Popov. Peter Popov, great. Okay, look, thanks for that. It gives me something good to think about. It's uh, Sydney Skeptics in the Pub as normal first Thursday of the month here at the Crown Hotel. And tonight's question sent in by a listener, this is pretty good, sent in by a listener is how long, and Ian Bryce, our chief investigator, he, I know he'll have an answer for this, how long should you keep hammering away at somebody, say with a conspiracy theory, before 
you give up. Okay, well, uh, my first instinct to that is that if they're not even interested in having a discussion with you, if they're fully decided, I don't think there's any point in trying. If they're, if they're not interested in having a back and forth, of having a dialogue, and of maybe questioning some of their ideas, and you've got to be you know, willing to look at their evidence too. But if that's not there, if that, I guess, sense of... What would you call it? Interest, sense of willing to inquire. If they don't have that, I don't think you should bother. So you you would be pretty short with them. I mean, what I mean by that is you wouldn't waste too much time on them. Not too much time, unless it's fun. If it's just fun, spend as long as you like, as long as it's still fun. <laughs> Good answer. Ian Bryce. Uh, the, so the question is... How long do you engage with somebody, a conspiracy theorist, for example, or somebody who believes in zero-point energy or whatever you you deal with, before you just have to to walk away? Yes, I'm not sure there's a logical answer, Richard, but I find that after two email exchanges, I just lose interest and and stop replying to them usually. Because usually by that time, they've shown whether they're listening to what you're telling them or reading the emails or whether they're just continuing with their standard line. So you've got a bit of feedback then so if you're not making any dent in them then uh, human nature says it's not worth the effort and you you have such correspondence with people as I was saying before who really believe that they've discovered or uh, been let in on the secret of free energy yes indeed I've spoken to many people like that some of them who really believe it and some of them who are clearly charlatans who didn't believe it from the start, but they found that it earns free money for them. So. <laughs> How do you tell the difference between the charlatan and somebody who's a true believer? Well, a true believer will usually be happy to, happy to talk to you with, without thinking in advance because they're, they're not deceptive. They're giving you a free exchange of information. But, but one applicant we had for the challenge was very guarded in his responses and it was clear that he was thinking thinking in detail before answering and his emails became very short so that was someone we didn't trust and, and we were able to exclude them from the challenge. It's a good point because in my various dealings at the Mind Body Wallet festivals when I've been talking to people behind the stands there are two types of people they're the true believers and the, the charlatans and most of the time people will bend my ear talk to me for a long time trying to convince me but sometimes people are very quick and want to get rid of me so I can sort of draw a certain conclusion from that I think yes indeed that, that could uh, illustrate the same type of people those, those who have already they know it's a scam but it's good for money anyway and they want to continue and they know that they, they're never going to convince you and they don't want to convince you they want to get rid of you because you, they're cramping your style and those who who might just uh, believe that through not having thought it through or not having seen any evidence, who are willing to talk. And at the moment, we uh, not to let out too much, not to let the cat out of the bag too much, we're investigating something at the moment which is to do with Wi-Fi radiation. It's promising. Yes, indeed. That sounds a bit to me like wind turbine syndrome. I think that one's been put to rest. But Wi-Fi radiation is certainly an interesting topic, and it, it's susceptible to science. There's lots of science and biology and engineering that uh, can be brought to bear on that. So I look forward to that one. It will be an interesting one. Are you worried about Wi-Fi radiation? No, but I am worried about if a person is unwell and they think they have Wi-Fi radiation syndrome, whatever it's called, and then if, they, if that stops them from going to seek help from a real doctor or, you know, whoever the relevant specialist is, that's what concerns me. That's a good answer. Well, folks, oh, your dinner's arrived, Ian. I better let you get on with that. Thank you very much. And it's the voice you know so well from the little ad we do for the Good Thinking Society. Trish, hello, Trish. Hello. Hello. Great to see you here at Skeptics in the Pub. Tonight's question. If you were engaging in a conversation or a debate with somebody, a conspiracy theorist, for example, how long do you think it's worthwhile keeping it going before... You basically stop, give up, and decide it's no longer worth your effort. Depends. Um, usually until I'm personally offended, <laughs> which happens a lot. I've, I've had some nasty conversations with people recently where, 
you think like, no, what you've said there is actually it's a, something that's affected me personally, and I'm not willing to get into a debate about it. Like is this the, with the conspiracy theories or something. Yeah, like that? yeah. So like, I don't mind when people talk about things like you know Roswell and that kind of stuff because that's non-personal to me. But as soon as you get onto you know crisis actors and that kind of thing, and that makes me very upset. So I, I'm not willing to debate, but I'll debate about aliens for hours happily for hours because I find it really interesting kind of the the mental hoops that people will jump through you know <laughs> and like again like I think it's more fun to talk to someone who genuinely believes it than with someone who just is doing it for a laugh as well so I like to hear what people actually think do they, and, and how often do you find people get really short with you I mean not just insulting but just decide that you're not worth their effort oh you see I tend to listen for the majority of the conversation so some people will hear an argument and then rebut that argument and hear another argument and rebut that argument I won't really do that because I like to listen to someone tie themselves up in knots I quite like that because often a conspiracy theorist will contradict themselves several times in the matter of only a few sentences and I quite like that because all you have to do is listen and it's the whole thing you know give someone enough rope it's, it's a good point, and often they're making things up on the fly, which, yeah. which to them fits their worldview. But they're making making things up. That's my experience, anyway. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like they'll have a seed of an idea, but they won't necessarily have thought it through. <laughs> so yeah, I will tend to give people more time than I probably should. Good answer. Thank you. <laughs> Australian Skeptics National Convention 2016 will be hosted in Melbourne at the University of Melbourne from the 25th to the 27th of November with the annual dinner being held at Melbourne Zoo on the evening of the 26th of November. Early bird ticket sales are online at the convention website convention.skeptics.com.au and if you get an early bird ticket you'll receive a discount and be able to reserve seats close to the stage. We can confirm that speakers for the convention will include Lawrence Krauss, Edzard Ernst, Harriet Hall, Michael Marshall, Katie Mack and Mel Thompson, with many more great speakers to be announced soon. Nicholas J. Johnson is our MC for the annual dinner. Information about our speakers is available from the convention website. So that's convention.skeptics.com.au. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone and thank you once again to those wonderful people, those wonderful people who contribute to The Skeptic Zone directly through being a patron through Patreon or simply chip in via uh, micropayments on PayPal and you can check out skepticzone.tv to see how you too, you too can uh, do that and keep The Skeptic Zone going. So if you uh, if you think The Skeptic Zone, uh, the pleasure and enjoyment and uh, interest you get out of the skeptic zone is worth a dollar or two a week and you might consider doing that and uh, all of us here at the skeptic zone would be very grateful coming up next week reports from skeptic camp brisbane our reporter heidi robertson was on the spot on the scene in action with her microphone and by the way that microphone was bought with funds sent in by listeners so thank you very much with her microphone getting interviews from skeptic camp brisbane can't wait to hear those myself, actually. And I think our reporter, Cassandra Perryman, was there as well. I don't know if she did anything, but I, I noticed on the web pages that uh, saw photographs she was there. And I hope to have news of yet another new team member for the Skeptic Zone pretty soon. Pretty soon. We're in negotiations. We're working on it. We're looking at the possibilities. But that's pretty exciting, so stay tuned for that. And just before I go, yes, Henrietta and Maud, the Skeptic Zone cats, are almost uh, too big to fit in their little box. We have we have little plastic boxes 
up on the on top of the uh, the set of drawers in the uh, studio here, little sort of uh, perspex boxes, uh, and they each climb in one and snooze up there. But they're almost getting too big for those. I'm a bit worried. Hmm. Anyway, for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for contacts, an archive of all episodes since 2008, and our online store. Please support the Skeptic Zone by following us on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, liking us on Facebook, and leaving a review on iTunes. You can also show your support by subscribing via PayPal for as little as 99 cents a week. The Skeptic Zone is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on The Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian Skeptics Inc. or any other skeptical organisations.